Welcome to Getting Heated, the place to debate and discuss all things surf related. We've got a big set coming in. The Jeep Surf French Pro is right around the corner. Who will make the bigger statement, the rookies or the wild cards? And there's some heavy hitters sitting far down on the leaderboard. Who will recover and who will likely fall off the CT? Plus, Uncle Willie just dropped the hot track. So it's time to ask, who's the best surfer musician of all time? Finally, is there really such a thing as beating your competitor before even getting in the water? Now to introduce this week's duo, here's Coco Ho. Hi everyone and welcome to Getting Heated. I'm joined by quite the pair today. First up, co-host of Ain't That Swell podcast, still recovering from his Cool and Gotta Live show, Von Blakey, and former world number one CT surfer, who's also dropping a country album as Uncle Willie, Matt Wilkinson. Congrats, Matt, on the new single. I do have to ask, how did you manage to wake surf behind the big horse? <laughs> It was a big horse. Yeah, I don't know. It was a it was a fun little idea that we had uh, when it was flooded, and the horse wasn't too shy on horsepower, so it actually it was a little bit easier than I expected, and it just yeah, it was good fun. Yeah, well, uh, I'm just hoping that uh, after today, mate, I send you back to your day job, which is being a cowboy rock star now. <laughs> yeah. Dead prestigious. I ride them bareback with a darkened soul. Yeah, I'm out of control. I'm a horse once was till I broke her in. Town folk be calling me the cowboy king. Vaughn, you had quite a big live show, and I'm hoping you can explain a few photos from the show. What is happening here? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yep, that is former world number one Dean Dingo Morrison. We did a, a live Ain't That Swell podcast at Cool and Gatter, and we had the the Three Degrees crew on the Cooley Kids, Dingo, Mick Fanning, and Joel Parkinson. And I just got a little bit excited by the thought of seeing Dingo again, and so I uh, couldn't help it pick him up and throw him around her for a little bit. <laughs> Did you have to carry all those guys off by the end? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, just about. <laughs> but this photo is as Jed sticking my Kelly Slater wig on so it doesn't fall off mid-gig. <laughs> those are incredible. I'm going to do my best to keep us on track. Let's start Heat 1 with the Jeep Surf Ranch Pro, which is right around the corner. The CT surfers are making the voyage to Central California for the Surf Ranch. It's off the beaten path, far from the coast, and some competitors haven't even surfed it yet. So the heat one question is, who will make a bigger statement at the Jeep Surf Ranch Pro? The rookies or the wild cards, including replacements? Vaughn, who are you taking? I'm going to go with the wild cards on this one, Coco. I think you're right. I think that time in the pool is absolutely crucial to uh, figure it out, to just get over the excitement of surfing it. The wild cards and the replacements – uh, they've, they've just got that little bit more experience. I mean, we heard Italo say in that last few seconds of him being at Rottnest, you know, Kelly, let me have more time in the pool because he's a guy who, you know, has been there, surfed it a bunch of times, but he surfed 17 waves in a heat. He, he needs to get there and feel it out. And I just think the rookies really need that time in the pool as well. I like what the wildcards are bringing to it. I think Nat Young, his vertical re-entry is, is way more windscreen wipey, so it's powerful and punchy, but he, he loses no speed. And Michael Dunphy, uh, I just can't see him really <laughs> letting this opportunity slip. And we saw the passion of that guy when he got through a clutch heat at the Sydney Surf Pro. Uh, it was a really tight one and he just, you know, you can see what he's going to be bringing to this event. So uh, I just... I feel like they're going to be stronger on the women's side. Uh, I feel like the best surfer I've seen in the pool in the last six months is Coco Ho, and she's back in the draw. So, Well, I was going to ask you, Vaughn, what board should I ride? Should I be riding that twinny? Oh, ride whatever you were <laughs> riding in those last couple of clips. If that's a twin, 100%. What do you think, Coco? Well, I agree with Coco. <laughs> I feel like. You can you can bet <laughs> against me. It's okay. <laughs> Um, Isabella, I think her turns fit perfectly for the pool. I think her whippy, like, fin release snap is going to fit super well in the pool. On the guy's side, I disagree with you on Morgan. I think he's short, fast, chunky. He's got that snap that, like, the half his tail comes above the lip. It's got power. There'll be spray. I reckon he'll get 15 of those backhand fin throws on that left and 
I reckon that's going to drop some big scores. I did let him go a closeout in the Pantin QS a couple of years ago and he did a big air reverse and beat me, you little bastard. <laughs> <laughs> When we return, it's the time of the season where surfers fight for their lives at the bottom of the leaderboard. Who will recover and who will say goodbye? And many have done it, but not all have done it well. Who stands out as the ultimate surfer musician of all time? We'll be right back. Welcome back to Getting Heated, a big, big show today with Matt Wilkinson, if you know, you know, and our favorite Swellian, Von Blakey. Matt, I want to know if you're going to be back on tour. What are your thoughts on the newest Challenger series? Um, yeah, well, I think, I think the Challenger series is a great idea. If it all kind of comes, if the world gets its shit together, <laughs> I, um, I might get that bug back and... Um, I don't know. I still feel like I can compete against the best guys. So I'd love to. Um, I'm definitely not hanging the competitive boots up completely, but um, I'm, I'm enjoying having a bit of time off. Mate, you're definitely competitive with the best surfs in the world. And I love the Challenger Series for exactly that reason. You don't have to uh, commit to an entire year of traveling. You don't have to commit to anything other than just those first events, those regional events. And you know, you might be the up and coming next Grom or you might be a guy who uh, surfed at the top level and was world number one for, you know, the best part of a year. It's just the best initiative that uh, the QS has been through in a long, long time. And I can't wait to see who makes it through there because I've just got a feeling we're going to be surprised by how many underground core lords start waving their flag and, and shocking a few people. Very, very true. There are some big names sitting far down the leaderboard right now. So for Heat 2, who will recover and who will likely fall off the CT this season? We'll go, go ahead and break some hearts first. <laughs> it's a, this is a tough one. A lot of the people on that bubble are really good friends of mine. <laughs> I kind of feel like there's a few guys that are on that, on that bubble and they're thinking, all right, if I just get through, get through this weird little year, I can give it a proper crack next year. As much as a, it saddens me to think, Ace being on that bubble, he's got a young family, it's going to be really tough for him to kind of find that motivation to push back. But in saying that, I don't know, he's amazing at Chopu, obviously, he's got a win there. He could definitely do it, and I think he'd love to go out on a big year. And then Owen Wright, he's back there, but he's way, way too good to to be in that position and I think he's gonna just claw his way out pretty pretty easily for the out of these next few events. I don't know, there's like a lot of people that are really close. Um, I'll tell you what I think, Wilco. Uh, I think everyone in the back half of the draw should be really worried. Even Owen, as good as he is, and yeah, he's got pet events coming up. He always does well in the pool, like you said, and, and Chopu. But man, oh man, it's the guys above them that they've got to be worried about. Everyone basically 18th or higher on the ratings is surfing with a lot of, even if they're not getting the consistency, they're surfing with a lot of hunger. And surfing without momentum and surfing with stress in your life, it just changes the way that you approach heats. It's in your head constantly if you're not doing as well as you want. You're not sort of like, you know, finishing a comp and going back and checking out your boards and stuff. You know, you're waking up in the middle of the night with this little stress boogeyman sitting on your shoulder, poking you in the face, going, "Hey, man, you're not you're not going that good this year," and it's it just seeps into every part of your life. And I just feel like that anxiety stiffens up your surf, and it makes you question your choices, uh, even with things like priority. And um, yeah, I just think those guys in that back half of the draw. Some of them aren't used to being there. But yeah, the big worry isn't just like them turning their games around. It's everyone who's above them is just looking so hungry. They don't look like they're going to be giving it up easy. So yeah, mate, I'm, I'm worried about it. I, even champions have the yips sometimes. And, uh, you know, when you start losing, it can be contagious. It's not just as simple as going, all right, I'll just turn it around at this next event. I've spent, I've spent some time on that bubble. And um, I think it can work both ways. I think the pressure gets to you you can get frustrated with bad results you can get eggy at the tour eggy at the judging eggy at your results eggy at everything but then once it does come down to crunch time i think guys like owen 
are going to just kind of snap back into that competition winning mindset and I think he'll he'll pretty easily switch back in there and do that and almost use that pressure as a as a positive he'll be thinking all right if I don't want this to be the end of my career he'll 100% into these next events and whatever's weighing him down or whatever is stressing him out he'll be able to get them out of his head and be like I know what I need to do right now and that's win some heats and um, I think he's good enough to do that. Mm. But on the second part of that is that with the Challenger Series and the QS restructure, the consequence isn't as great falling off tour anymore. Like you, you come off, you've got a full off season to, to get your, your gear back together and you could be back on tour without skipping a, a single CT event. I'm just looking at the women's draw too, mate, and, and it's just such a familiar log jam, unfortunately, on that cusp. We have Malia, Nikki, Sage, and Macy. They seem to be names that are constantly around that zone, even though we know that they're capable of, of making finals and being stronger than that. What do you think, Coco? Yeah, I do think that the seating, because the women's tour is smaller, it's only 17 women. So the seating's a little tougher. You're constantly, if you're lower on the draw, you're constantly drawing Carissa, Caroline, Lakey, or whoever's in the top three. And it's really hard. You need to beat them like several times to start cracking a lot of quarters. And yeah, to change the top five, it's like almost impossible. <laughs> Women's world champions are so much greedier than anyone else. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. <laughs> and Steph also. She's, she's been greedy. <laughs> they don't want to share ever. They just want all the world titles and all the wins for themselves. They're just... Share the, share the love. Come on. Well, the next topic is in honor of the one and only Uncle Willie. I'm a cowboy and I'm living a side with a big horse right between my thighs. Yeah. Wilco, a.k.a. Uncle Willie, just dropped a hot track. I can't say the title because this is a family-friendly show. But if you haven't checked it out yet, you have to. So for Heat 3, in honor of Wilco's debut album, we're asking the question, who is the ultimate surfer slash musician of all time? Vaughn, who do you give the award to? Okay, um, I do have some nominees. I'm going to nominate uh, Kingsley Looker, former CT concert pianist who uh, played for the Queen once. Wash with Creed McTaggart, Bo Foster and Ellis Erickson for playing with Iggy Pop. That was huge in my life. But I think my winner is going to be Paul Fisher, the ultimate doof doof crazy man who has played Coachella and been nominated for a Grammy and finished runner up in the single fin at Burley this year. <laughs> Go the fish. He's done unbelievable. He's been so successful, which is so cool to see. But um, it's such a wild, wild thing to see how many surfers are great musicians and there's there's rappers, there's pianists, there's techno guys, there's now a country boy. <laughs> yeah, mate, yeah. But uh, I don't know. Some bands are, are guilty, man. Some bands are full-blown pro surfer enablers, I reckon, you know, because every pro surfer thinks that they've got a handle on music. But Pearl Jam have invited everyone, like, from Slater to Oki to Mick Fanning on stage to sing in front of people. They believe that they're rock stars after they come off stage, mate. Half of them want to do the Uncle Willie and just set off on their new careers. <laughs> yeah, I guess it probably works the other way too. I gave Angus Stone a surfboard. I think it's still in his garage and hasn't moved yet, but he probably thinks he's a surf <laughs> musician now <there> too. <laughs> I do have to ask, Wilco, what's your experience been like thus far? Um, yeah, it's been it's been a, a pretty wild little little thing. No one really knows if I'm 100% serious or not, but um, I am. <laughs> when we return, can you really beat your competitor before getting in the water, or is that just a myth? We're going deep into some competitive tactics when we come back. Welcome back to Getting Heated. I'm joined by two surfers who are now performers as well. How do you guys get psyched before performing or taking the stage? Um, I haven't actually played a live gig yet, so uh, I wouldn't know, but um, South by Southwest, hit me up. 
<laughs> uh, it's real easy, Wilco. You just do 300 push-ups, then you do 14 backflips and you land in an ice bath. And you slap yourself in the face a few times and then you get out there. Same as preheat warm-up then. Yeah, exactly the same. <laughs> same. <laughs> There are so many infamous stories of preheat psychouts to steal the win with tactics outside of the water. Is it true that you can actually have your opponent beat before you ever even get in the water? Wilco, what's your experience with this? Yeah, a lot of surfers have used those tactics. Kelly was probably the master at it and still is. I know just even the, the whole like paddling out, you want to paddle out on the side that gets you the inside and then if you're against one of the guys that you know is going to do it, you can almost like mess with them by just like pushing them a little further and a little further. Guys like Gabriel Medina up until this year is just always one of the inside, no matter what, no matter whether it stops you catching a wave for a long time. Um, yeah, there was no better example than Adriano D'Souza at restaurants in Fiji. He just was like, unbelievably relentless and I think no matter who he was against knew what they were up against but there's almost no way to combat it and while they get angry he gets happy <laughs> he's like all right I, like I, I'm in the zone right now <laughs> yeah I reckon uh, I, I love preheat psych outs I love the, the mind games and any sort of tactical edge that surfers employ to get in the heads of their competitors um kelly is number one We're, on all the ain't that's world podcasts we do whenever we have a guest you can just guarantee if you say oh what have you had a run-in with kelly before a heat or has he done something to put you off and to a man every single surfer will say yes and it's it's everything from you know uh i think uh, we had darren o'rafferty on the other day and he said that he had a, a k leash remember kelly had the the k leashes and the k fins for a while and he went to go grab his board before the heat and he saw that his K leash had been moved onto Kelly's board. Not saying Kelly did it, but it was not on his <laughs> board anymore. And you could just imagine Kelly kind of going, oh, I don't see your name on it. It was something like that. But um, another cool one that I heard was Kelly like walking up to someone preheat and going, oh, wow, I wish I had the uh, the balls to ride a 511 in out there. You know, just just weird little <laughs> digs and, and, uh, and things that just instantly put you off your game. You know, the, the, the great one that that sticks out that really got employed was uh, when Mick Fanning was a wild card against Danny Wills at Bells and he paddled out. And Willsey was his all-time hero and he, he said g'day to him and like, how good's this? And Willsey just shined him, didn't speak to him at all. And uh, even though Wills ended up losing, I think Mick Fanning just went, all right, well, that's the attitude I'm going to do. And he didn't speak to anyone for, what, 17 years on tour, Wilco? Did you ever speak to him in a heat? <laughs> No, that was a weird one. There were a few guys that were just dead silent out in the water. And then I reckon there's even, it, it would start kind of earlier than earlier than that as well. You'd have guys like Hedgy at Bells. There was, he was out there at 3 a.m. just so he could be the first guy in the water so everyone else would get there and be like, well, he's got an edge on me. <laughs> Kelly in the competitors area would just wouldn't speak to him pretty much wouldn't see him for like three or four events and then you'd have a heat with him and everywhere you go for the two days leading up to your heat kelly would be there just like oh so you get a sick one you're like oh, what's going on here and just is somehow is just everywhere and like he's being nice but deep down you there's just something in you that or oh, i don't know he's just had a way that just kind of melts you from the inside. <laughs> yeah, that's classic because he always plays the innocent card when it comes to that stuff too. He's always baffled that, that people, maybe it's like, uh, you know, when you drive a yellow car, you see a yellow car everywhere. When you've got Kelly in a heat, you start seeing him <laughs> everywhere. It's one of those things. Yeah. But um, the most bizarre sort of preheat psych up or psych out I've ever seen was, was a six star in France years and years ago and um, Chris Davidson again was uh you know he was just this lively charismatic absolute wild man and he was just going up to his competitors as they were warming up for their heat and just grabbing them in a bear hug and just shaking them up and down and going let's do this <laughs> let's do this and it was the most bizarre thing i've ever seen but they turn around and they just be going yeah let's go Dave. and it was like i think it was him and uh g had coder in the final and 
They were basically just standing there slapping each other's faces, trying to get each other, like, who could get the most psyched for the final. <laughs> like, I've never seen anything like it. It was incredible. I think um, times have changed a bit now. That's called assault. <laughs> 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 Very true. Well, yeah, can you tell us who's the biggest strikeout queen on the women's tour? Because, like, uh, from the outside looking in, you guys are always best friends and always hanging out and always having a great time. And you always hear that cliche that it's not till you pull your rashies on that you start, you know, the game starts. But when you're out of the rashie, it's all fun and games. But surely someone is in there stinking up that competitor's area with some hectic comp vibes. <laughs> yeah, my dad has always tripped on that, how like calm and cool the girls are. He's like, can you stop talking to Steph out there? Um, <laughs> I think the most intimidating was probably Courtney Conlog, but now we're such good friends, like honestly, that she's not intimidating anymore to me in heats. Um, yeah, but my coach, when I was being coached by Matt Bemrose, he's like, please, can you just go way up in someone's grill and like ask them what they're doing for Christmas? Or like, and I'm like, no, I'm not that brave. I feel like Tyler had had a year or two that she looked pretty scary pre heat and she's shadow boxing. Oh, the boxing, yeah, and the dancing. Yeah. But then it turned into a dance. And I was like, yeah. yeah, I dance with you too. <laughs> oh, I can't, I can't wait. Someone's, someone's coming. Tati's kind of got a bit of that, hasn't she? Yeah, she definitely won't look at you in the heat. She won't talk. Maybe more like a Mick, you know, like just focus. No one wants to talk to their competitors, but I mean, if if there's a lull or if it's Steph, I'm usually talking. <laughs> That does it for today's episode of Getting Heated. We're gonna go right off on our big <laughs> horses. See ya. <laughs> <laughs>